Hello everyone. I wish you a good day, a good afternoon and a good evening. Welcome to the final debate of this fun virtual tournament 2021 in room 19. Our host in this session is Dale Derritry, who will be managing the technical aspects of a match. Judge Alice Hoffman is a former president and member of the board of directors of the National Space Society. She's a professional engineer and project slash pro uh, program manager. Judge Rebecca Steiner is a recent PhD in communication studies and assistant debate coach at the University of Georgia. She previously coached at Wake Forest University and the University of Florida. She has coached several teams to the national debate tournament, including the 2019 NDP finalist and the 2019 ADA championship. Becca also judged in the 2020 fun debate program. Welcome to the debate judges. Judges, please remain in the Zoom room at the end of the debate for reporting purposes. And I'm the moderator and facilitator for room 19 and my name is Sovic. I would like to read the following statement to you. The winning team is chosen based on the skill and effort, not on any preset MSS position. MSS clearly believes that humanity should continue to explore, develop and settle space. However, MSS also believes that open, honest debate will facilitate that goal. It is important that space advocates understand and be able to express the anti-space case. No statement by any debater or coach is an official position of NSS. I also have some important information about winning in this fun debate format. This fun debate presents a distinct and a wonderful challenge that incorporates an exciting and novel method of cooperation. To be clear, ignoring opposition's content, exclusion of debaters, aggressive tones, and interactions will count against your chance of winning the debate. What counts for winning this fun debate is that you demonstrate mutual respect inclusion of all debaters, constructive interactions, listening, the quality and substance of the concept you present. These are the tenets of universalization which are reinforced in this debate format. Now, let's meet our debaters. The first team is Team Alcantara, which is named for a spaceport in Brazil. Team Alcantara, please give us your name and the country you are representing. Hello everybody. Hello, everybody. Oh, sorry. Okay, Daniela, you can start, you can start. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Well, hello everybody. Um, my name is Daniela. Uh, I'm from Peru. Hello everybody. My name is Andre, and I'm from Russia, Romania. And besides that, I want to say good luck to everybody. Hello, my name is Maria Chupala, and I'm also from Romania. Thank you so much. Next, Team Andoya, named for the spaceport located in Norway. Team Andoya, please give us your name and the country you're representing. Hello, my name is Valentina Manosalva and I'm from Peru. Hello, my name is Fajr and I'm from the United Arab Emirates. Hello, my name is Denis and I'm from Romania. Hello, my name is Andre and I'm from Romania. Thank you. Uh, now, if Dr. Edmonds would like to speak a few words to the debaters, please. All right, I'll say again, good luck, best wishes. And I even love the original introduction of being so kind to everybody, but I can't say enough that I think you know what you're doing and I'm really looking forward to how you're going to integrate universalization into this incredible new frontier that we're embarking on in this world as part of this huge universe. So wishing you all the very best to this next challenge and onto the frontier with this next generation of leaders. I know you're going to be out of this world. Thank you so much, Dr. Edmonds. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand in your participants icon on your screen. Please mute your mic unless you're speaking and only the presenting team and judges should turn on their videos unless directed by the moderator. Our debating format today follows the same format as on June 11, 2021. All right, Mr. Delitri, do we have only the judges and the affirmative team with live videos and mics? Uh, and Doya, oh, yes, yes, we do. Only have only the judges and no team members with mics. Thank you. Um, Let's get started. 
We'll hear from the first speaker from Team Alcantara represent the affirmative position for the resolution. Space traffic management should be regulated by the United Nations Security Council. Team Alcantara, your first speaker may begin your affirmative intro. You have three minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Respected jury, coaches, and my fellow mates, a very good morning, afternoon, evening to one and all present here. My name is Daniela, and I will be the first speaker from Team Al Alcantara. The second speaker, Andre, will present to you an argument about space pollution, the disadvantages it brings, and why the UN Security Council should be responsible for this. After that, Maria will talk about space agencies' development, and in the end, uh, Andre will summarize the debate make the final statements and conclude why we definitely think the UN Security Council should be responsible um, to regulate STM. First, I would like to define some terms from the proposed resolution. Space traffic management is defined by the International Academy of Astronautics as the set of technical and regulatory provisions for promoting safe access into outer space or in in operations in outer space and return from outer space to Earth, free from physical or radio frequency interference. Space traffic includes uh, launch vehicles as well as orbiting objects, for instance, um, satellites of all sizes. The UN Security Council has primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. It has 15 members, from which five are permanent, and each member has one vote. This means a huge collaboration between 15 countries, something that is also called universalization. This way we can go to space as humanity and not as countries. Besides that, according to Andrew J. Dilk in Journal of Air Law and Commerce, space traffic is currently managed and regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. Now, I want you to be careful to this. As we already know, the UN Security Council is split up into six organizations, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the Secretariat and International Court of Justice. According to globalpolicy.org, the Security Council is the United Nations' most powerful body because it's the only part that the other organizations listen to. UNOSA is the United Nations Office of for Outer Space Affairs, which promotes peaceful and safe use and exploration of space, being regulated by the UN Security Council for international cooperation that is a sign of active universalization. According to Director Simon, Simonetta Di Pippo, UNOSA is a sub-department of the secretary body. Its power is shown by the fact that it cannot do anything without the UN Security Council. It only managed to realize seven guidelines, also called recommendations about debris. This is why UNOSA and ITU don't have enough power to be responsible by themselves of STM regulations. They need the UN Security Council. So we will demonstrate to you why the UN Security Council should definitely regulate space traffic management. Next, after the affirmative team gives the introduction and the definitions, Andre will present you with the first argument. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. Now, next one from Team Andoya. Please give us your three minute intro, your time, Starts now. Distinguished judges, honorable audience, it is my privilege to make the introduction for the negative team Andoya. We affirm that space traffic management should not be regulated by the United Nations Security Council. We find two main justifications for our positioning. The UNSC is a poor regulator for space traffic, while there are already more competent regulators in the UN. First of all, United Nations already regulates STM through the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which includes the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. These institutions created STM rules making an impact worldwide. Basically, in, a, in analogy to car traffic, they created road lanes, parking spots, and traffic lights for space traffic. Also, these institutions are better enforcers than the UNSC and promote universalization, rather than targeting economies and bringing poverty, as UNSC does. Therefore, empowering the Security Council would be a worse option for STM than the status quo. Here comes one central concern. Is the UNSC even capable of STM regulation? Their experience is solely terrestrial. We will show you how they mismanage conflict here on Earth, Earth, although the current state of the world is showing that pretty obviously. Also, we are concerned that the permanent members might veto critical decisions unless those decisions promote their national interest. All things considered, are some countries chosen 75 years ago relevant for our future space affairs? We'll prove through several examples that emerging space powers can be drastically affected by vetoes by the current permanent members of the UNSC. This brings us to the center point of this debate. Is the UNSC bringing in universalization? 
LJ Edmund and Seth Baker indicated in their paper introducing universalization, the risk of increasing military presence in outer space. That alongside an eventual commitment to asteroid mining, colonization and increasing communication mean that space affairs will become intertangled with the terrestrial ones. Universalization is the path of equity is the path for equity and inclusion on the way towards a space society. As the UNSC has in its record significant failures here on Earth, we can only imagine what consequences will their first spatial mistake have. We believe that the UNSC will exacerbate competition, denying us universalization with respect to space affairs. To close it up, UN already regulates STM through institutions such as the UNOSA and the Interagency Space Debris Co Coordina Coordination Committee. UNSC is both useless among the other institutions and incompetent, since in raison d'etre is conflict. If we associate space exploration, one of the noblest endeavors of the human species, with an institution designed to manage war, which shows the most abject part of human nature, we make a huge mistake. There are plenty of successful examples of applied universalization by the UN when it comes to space, and my teammates will expand on that. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. Now let's hear from AF2 from Team Alcantara for a beginning three minute arguments. Your time starts. No. Hello, everybody. My name is Borkman Bukhara-Andre. And as you heard earlier from my team and Daniela, I will be talking about space pollution and why I would truly believe that the UN Security Council should regulate STM. According to NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, an article published in November, it was mentioned that the space station has maneuvered three times in 2020 to avoid debris. Besides that, on 2nd June 2021, just two weeks ago, space junk hit the International Space Station, leaving a hole in the robotic arm. So the safety in space is not right on point, isn't it? Let's take a look at the UN Security Council. It is split up into six organs. The General Assembly, the UN Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trustship Council, the Security Rights, and the International Court of Justice. According to globalpolicy.org and UN.org, the Security Council is United Nations' most powerful body. And it is the only body that organs listen to and that can issue binding rules. And now you may ask, what proof does exist showing that the UN Security Council would be better to regulate STM rather than the FAA, for example? What about UNOSA, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and COPUS, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which has 95 permanent country members? These are organizations that totally depend on the UN Security Council. For example, according to Hertzfeld, Director of Space Policy Institute, the Bryce R-32 North Korean satellite was launched in December 2012. You know, so wanted to launch that, but they needed approval from the U.S. Security Council as well. If they don't get the approval, a satellite can't be launched. So the U.S. Security Council already has a starting point regarding STM. According to the director, Simonetta Di Pipo, UNOSA is a sub-department of the secretary body. Its power is shown by the fact that it cannot do anything without the U.S. Security Council. It only managed to release seven recommendations about debris. This is why UNOSA does not have enough power to be responsible by themselves of, regula of regulating STM. They need the UN Security Council. According to Simonetta Di Pipo, director of UNOSA, UNOSA is partnering with Sierra Space, a private space agency. The United Nations has demonstrated its leadership and support in promoting dialogue between governments, encouraging the development of national and private agencies, and the implementation of norms to deal with space congestion. According to an article published in May 2019, ESA is already teaming up with the United Nations. If you collaborate at a higher or bigger scale, we can then go to space as humanity, not as ESA or NASA, something that is called universalization itself, as it is respectful not only for the environment, but also for humankind. Do you know which the most important aspect of letting UNSC regulate STM is? Over 14,000 pieces of space junk belong to Russia. UNSC is the only big organization in which Russia is involved, so it is clearly the key for removing space debris. Thank you. This is one reason we think that UN Security Council should regulate STM. The second argument will be brought by Mariah and will illustrate the collaboration between agencies and their development. Thank you, Speaker Two. We now have a one minute silent break.
15 seconds left. Time's up. Next two from Team Andoya, please give us your beginning arguments and respond to AF2 in a six minute time allotment. Your time starts now. Regular space traffic through the UNSC is a bad method to implement bad measures. I will show you how space traffic is already highly regulated and the intervention of the UNSC would only discourage space interest in space exploration and slowing our expansion. First of all, every satellite requires a frequency to communicate with the Earth. As a 2018 paper by Paul Lawson, professor of space law at Georgetown University said, these frequencies are regulated by the International Telecommunication, Telecommunication Union, a branch of the UN. Therefore, as space launches depend on having available radio slots, ITU is an important regulator in a field certainly not lacking regulation. ITU has a power leverage tool, control over radio frequencies. This means that a space agent who does not obey these rules can lose communication with its satellites. This control mechanism is more beneficial than anything that the UNSC possesses because it targets precisely the space programs, leaving other areas such as economy and diplomacy untouched. Therefore, it does not bring poverty and allows universalization to take place unhindered by diplomatic sanctions. Moreover, every space power has its own regulation and safety procedures. Apart from these rules, there are international regulations being enforced. The institution responsible for them is the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, which is part of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. COPUOS regulates through treaties ratified by the UN General Assembly. So it ensures both representativity and, comp and competence, as well as cooperation between experts and politicians. Moreover, any country can become a member of COUPUS and its decisions are based equally on the consensus between countries. This is an example of universalization that does not exist in the USC who have permanent members and veto right. The resolution presented today creates a jurisdiction problem between the UNSC and COPOUS. Which of these two institutions will control UNUSA? This double hierarchy of space command is an example of improper management which will result in worsening the situation of STM. This will only decrease the interest in space exploration, making the status quo clearly preferable. Even space debris are already regulated. The Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee consists of international experts who propose solutions to mitigate the risk of space debris. This institution produced a set of rules concerning space gen, approved by the United Nations General Assembly. These rules are now mandatory for any agency in America, including private ones, the ESA, and many others. These rules assemble basic traffic rules. For example, when a satellite ends its mission, it must go to graveyard orbit, analogs to parking lots for cars. This is a true example of applied universalization, a global cooperation led to a set of global rules. When it comes to existing space junk, Existing agencies already have their own projects. The European Space Agency plans to commission the world's first successful space removal by 2025. Also this year, ESA has started cooperating with UNUSA in raising awareness towards space debris. Space agencies want to remove space debris and take the concrete action in this field because they want to safely explore space. No regulation from the UNSC will be greater incentive than our nat natural desire for exploration as well as immediate benefits from space missions, such as GPS or satellite communication. We would also like to introduce the UN Space, a forum where the UN entities can meet and discuss on space-related themes. There are over 30 institutions involved, but the UNSC has never participated. This supports that the Security Council is neither capable nor desired when it comes to regulating STM. Instead, we have numerous of specialized institutions in this field that can truly bring universalization universalization in space governance. My teammates will present to you even more disadvantage of the UNSC, as well as some better prospect to regulators. But before that, I will stress a few points made by the affirmative team. The UN sec secretariat is not controlled by the UNSC, but rather by the General Assembly. So the UNSC does not control UNUSA and COPOUS. Also, the UNSC has no power by itself to eliminate space debris because it relies on agencies to do that. Those agencies try different techniques to eliminate debris. Since there is no perfect technology, therefore, 
we should have multiple approaches between, but because we don't know which is best. COPOUS has 95 members and the USC only has 15. So it's obvious that COPOUS bring more brings more universalization. Also, its decisions are taken based upon its consensus and not vetoes. UNUSA can't have two bosses, the UNSC and COPOUS. Thank you. Thank you, Nektu. We now have one minute silent break at this time. Fifteen seconds more. Time's up. Act two of Kalakantara now returns for a three minute response to neck two. Your time starts now. Okay, so hello again, everybody. Uh, I would like to make my speech into parts for the, for the first speaker of team uh, Andoya and for the second speaker. So the first speaker defined UNOSA, but he did not clearly explain the connection between the UN Security Council and UNOSA. We explained that in our arguments and we said that UNOSA is a sub-department of the General Assembly and that UN Security Council has the biggest power. I have also given you an example of the North Korean Bright Star Treaty satellite where UNOSA clearly listens to the U.S. Security Council, and I'm going to explain that for a second speaker as well. We agree with him that UNOSA is regulating STM, but it does not have enough power. It only managed to release several recommendations about space debris and not to put anything in practice. They don't have the budget for that, and my colleague Mariah will further talk about that in her argument. They need the UN Security Council for this. Take the example of the North Korean tree to Bright Star Satellite. What happened then? Well, you know, someone wanted to launch a satellite, but the UN Security Council told them, don't launch it. It has malicious purposes. Then what happened? You know, someone launched it without permission. And then the UN Security Council gave a resolution, a regulation, the 2087 regulation, and they simply destroyed their satellite. So they destroyed what they launched. Besides that, the second speaker uh, talked about E2. E2 is a sub-department of the General Assembly. Do you know how the General Secretary of E2 was elected? Uh, just listen to this. The representative of E2 is Huo Lin Zhao, the General Secretary. How was he elected? Well, the Secretary General selection is a subject to the veto of any of the five prominent members of the Security Council. So it was chosen by the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council is regulating E2. So it's basically regulating what they proposed. Besides that, regarding the number of the countries, uh, the UN Security Council, yes, it has only 50 members from which five are permanent, but the 10 members are rotating once two years, so it basically covers the entire planet. How the 95 members out of UNOSA, so their geographical position is not as good as uh, the UN Security Council wants. And why I'm saying that is because I'm saying that UNOSA should better collaborate with UN Security Council in order for them to regulate STM. So UN Security Council should regulate STM with the help of UNOSA because UNOSA can't do this by themselves. You already mentioned an organization that already manages space debris and said it is useful. Well, if it is that useful, why are we still debating this? Why was the ISS hit two weeks ago and uh, that space debris destroyed its arm? According to an Article 9 of the Outer Space Debris, spacefaring states should act to reduce space debris generation and mitigate threats posed by their space objects. This is why the UN Security Council is best for that, as it involves all the countries from the whole planet. We have clearly shown you how UNOSA and E2 listens to the UN Security Council and how it is best for the U.S. Security Council to cover all this, because as I already presented you, more than Thank half- Thank you, Aftu, but your time is up. 
Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Let's now hear from F1 and 2 and NEG and 1, 1 and 2 in a four minute cross examination. Alcantara will begin the crossing. Your time starts now. Okay, so uh, I want to ask speaker to you, you said something about an organization that already uh, regulates space debris. Could you please elaborate on that? Because I haven't understood which organization that is. Yeah, um, so this is the Interagency Space Debris and Coordination Committee, which is currently regulating space traffic. And it proposed a resolution to help them, um, um, proposed, it proposed a resolution that was voted by the General Assembly to help them clear space debris and regulate space. Okay, and uh, the first speaker, do you think that this organization is doing its job at the moment? Well, of course, there are there is still space debris in the orbit, but let's not forget that this hasn't been an issue for too long. There have uh, there haven't been so many initiatives. Uh, it it's it just now started to become a more serious problem. It wasn't okay. for ten years. Okay. Then why did in 2009 two satellites collide at some high speed bursting into a cloud of cloud, into a cloud of space debris? Like, like excuse me, what, what is the question? So I'm you said that this problem has started. So this is a currently problem that is happening now, but it also happened in the past in 2009, for example. Daniela, well, accidents happen. That doesn't mean we don't have rules. Car traffic is regulated. There are a few, uh, there are rules, but accidents still happen. Okay. I see that they have uh, improved that a lot. Uh, Daniela, would you like to ask that question as well, please? Mm, yes. Um, what is the connection between the UNOSA and the UN Security Council? So you both can answer that. No, the UNOSA answers to the Secretariat and the Secretary answers to the General Assembly where every country is invited to participate in and have an equal, and their vote has an equally impact, an equally impact. Okay, then why did uh, the US Security Council release a regulation against what UNOSA did? And why did UNOSA not listen to the UN Security Council because they need the UN Security Council, they need to listen to it. Like the UN Security Council needs to approve what they do. So if we think like this, it is kind of a boss of them. I'm not saying it's a boss, but let's just think if someone, if you need approval from someone to do something, then it kind of, you know, so kind of depends on the UN Security Council. And besides that, it only managed to release several recommendations about debris. Like they didn't do anything by themselves. They need the power of the US Security Council. Well, um, yeah, you can, you can answer that. Okay, so um, basically, um, it's an imminent security problem, which is not a permanent situation. However, regulation is permanent. And that means um, the UNSC does not have full control of UNUSA, and it's not the boss of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's that it does not have full control. Yeah, I agree with you there. But you know, Sa didn't manage to do anything till now. Like I'm sorry to interrupt, but we'll give extra 30 seconds for Team Andrea to ask a question as they don't get a chance. Okay, so uh I just to finish my uh question, what I was saying was that you know Sa didn't do anything in practice and that's my point. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, uh, how do you plan, how do you plan the USC or how does the UNSC plan to remove space debris? Okay, so uh, for this question, um, 
with the help of the collaboration between UNOSA and the UNSC, because UNOSA has the recommendations, it has the plan, but it has not the power to make that mission to remove this debris. Besides that, more than half of the debris out there in space is uh, Russian debris. The U.S. Security Council has the power to determine Russia to take its debris out because according to the Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, the country that makes something needs to clear their mess out. So this is what I'm saying. The U.S. Security Council has the power to convince Russia to take their mess out to clear more than half of the space debris and besides that to put in practice what... Thank you so much, but the time, the time for cross is up. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, now let's hear from Astri from Team Alcantara for the first half of your argument for three minutes. Your time starts now. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Chupal, and today I'm going to demonstrate you why we think that the UN Security Council should definitely regulate space traffic management. It is a president that the United Nations can regulate space by ensuring that resources will be distributed equally in the future and not to generate a political conflict between countries, something that represents a characteristic of universalization. According to Jonathan Meduel, an astronomer for the Harvard Center of Astrophysics, he said at a virtual web summit in 2020 that we are at the beginning of a new space investor revolution. So there is a need to have a space traffic management capable of handling the current space scenario to encourage the development of these space agencies and ensure their safety and sustainability of their space activities and operations something respectful, not only for our planet, but also for humanity, called universalization. There is a platform that in 2010, UNOSA, coordinated by the UN Security Council, launched the Human Space Technology Initiative, which provides an exchange of information and activities related to space exploration to encourage collaboration between countries. According to the United Nations website, the initiative is part of an effort to enable access to space, education, data, technology, and research, creating access to space for all. Now, let me present you the second proof of how the UN Security Council has already developed space policies and should be responsible for the STM. ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, has 193 states members. Its space service department is responsible for coordinating and recording procedures for space system, but also managing the procedures for space-related assignment plans already having a space policy. The representative of ITU uh, is Harman Zo, the general secretary. How was he elected? The secretary general selection is, is a subject to the veto of any of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. So it was chosen by the UN Security Council. One more time, ITU needs the UN Security Council's power. According to ITU in that end, the International Telecommunication Union also coordinates cybersecurity. ITU includes strategies in five work areas, legal measures, technical and procedural measures, organizational structures, capacity building, and international cooperation. Besides that, let's take a look at the budget. According to Simonetta Di Pipo, director of UNOSA, in proposed program budget, UNOSA budget is $3.9 million. According to Daniel, budget of the ITU for 2020-2021, ITU's budget for this year was $300,000. According to Louise Blanchfield, specialist in international relations, the UN Security Council has $6.58 billion budget, way bigger than UNOSA and ITU, one more time showing its power. Thank you. This is the second argument why we think that the UN Security Council should definitely regulate space traffic management because they also encourage universalization by helping the private space agencies, which is truly important. Thank you. Thank you, Astri. We now have a one minute silent break. Ten seconds left. Time is up now.
Next three from Team Andoya, please give us your remaining arguments and response to AF3 in a six minute time allotment. Your time starts now. I'd like to begin by uh, remarking some flaws in judgment from the affirmative team. For example, they mentioned that only the Security Council can enforce uh, measures on Russia because R Russia belongs only to the Security Council when it comes to space-related institutions. However, this is not true. Since the Soviet times, since the 50s, Russia is a member of COPUS, and that means it is already a member of an organization involved in space affairs. And COPUS is the organization who truly leads UNOSA. The United States Security Council has no authority over UNOSA, but COPUS has. In fact, UNOSA is the mere secretary of COPUS, so they are clearly subordinate to COPUS. What the affirmative side is proposing is having two bosses for the same institution, namely UNOSA. It's that this institution can simply no work with two bosses. This is simply impossible in terms of management. Now I'd like to stress on the problem they issued regarding budget. It's, it's true that UNSC has a much bigger budget than any space institution, but the UN Security Council was designed for a whole lot of problems than regulating space exploration. They already have a lot of things on their plate. They have terrestrial conflicts and their efficacy in limiting them is pretty limited. Crises are spread all over the world. In Somalia, Libya, Cyprus, Ukraine, Nagorno-Karabakh, to name some recent ones. Apart from this, there are several peacekeeping missions all over the world, such as in Chad, but they are simply not as effective as we would like them to be. Therefore, they are not a capable enforcers of measures regarding terrestrial issues. How can we expect them, if they are no space experts, to enforce regulation regarding space affairs. They are simply not qualified for this because they are not scientists. They are diplomats, politicians, but not scientists, not space experts. Now I'd like to stress upon the veto right. The veto right is a significant problem for space affairs because there are conflicts even between great powers. India is a great power, is an emerging space power, but is an, is not a permanent member of the UNSC. It has no veto right, but China, who is currently one of the biggest enemies of India on the international arena, has that veto right. We should expect that China uses its veto right to block Indian space programs. And this is the exact opposite of the universalization we so much want. The Center for Space Policy and Strategy shows in a September 2020 paper that technological advances lead to a democratization of space exploration. For example, today even high schools of universities can launch CubeSats. These CubeSats are small satellites which are also cheap. Moreover, CubeSats were even, even considered for space debris removal in the orbital debris mitigation competition for university students, which had NSS Enterprise in Space program among its organizers. Even if we make UNSC responsible for eliminating space debris, they still have to rely on national agencies. And the affirmative has no clear plan for managing this kind of interaction. Now, I would like to present you a point of view expressed by General James Dickinson, commander of US Space Command, who distinguished in a speech given on January 26th of this year, 2021, between space missions which threat national security and ordinary ones. The affirmative already gave an example of such a threatening mission when they say the UNSC blocked a UNOSA satellite. But, the general, but General Dickinson argued that usual space traffic should be regulated by the Department of Commerce, while the Space Command will only respond to imminent dangers. This kind of danger corresponds on an international scale to those very limited situations where UNSC intervention is really required. But this is not the general case because right now space is mostly used for commercial purposes. Think only of the numerous space tourist projects which, which are expected to depart this year. There is clearly a lot more room for economy in space affairs. And therefore, we should have trade organizations responsible, responsible for regulation, not military ones, not the UNSC. Therefore, we sh should propose that World Trade Organization regulate space affairs. This is not our invention. 
Former executive secretary of the National Space Council, Scott Paste, proposed World Trade Organization as an option when colonization will make Moon Treaty obsolete. This proposal is 10 years old, but prospective Moon colonies keep it even more, more actual than ever. Think only that we will require some sort of property in space. We will have space hotels. We will have space mining colonies on the moon. Therefore, we will need some kind of property. And this should be the responsibility of a commerce organization because property is the fundament of economics. Now, I'd like to stress about the universalization aspect. If we block minor initiative and leave space only to big actors, if you block CubeSats, which make kids involved in exploring space, therefore we will reduce democracy in space and we will reduce universalization in, and we won't want this. We want an universal space where everyone can launch uh, missions regardless of the budget, regardless of the relationship with great powers. We have veto right in the UN Security Council, which is since 1945 the same. There has been no changes in those powers, even if there were big changes on the international arena and space actors are not only the permanent members of the UN Security Council. Thank you. Thank you, Nectri. We now have a one minute silent break. Fifteen seconds left. Time is up. Ask three of Alcantara now returns for response to neck three for three minutes. The time starts now. Hello again. You said flaws in the judgment. I don't think so. We haven't said, and, and we also, we haven't said that Russia belongs only to the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council is the only one who has the power to make it clear it's a mess. COPUS is a department of the General Assembly. Isn't the UN Security Council the most powerful organ? Isn't it the most powerful team in the General Assembly? How can you mention two bosses? We haven't said anything about that. You know, Saint Copus already listened to the UN Security Council. And the uh, second speaker, speaker gave you a, an example about the satellite that had uh, that after the satellite, there were regulation against the, the UNOSA because it didn't listen to the UN Security Council. You mentioned that the UN Security Council has nothing especially done in, uh, on Earth. Did you know about the attack on Cuba? In 1962, UN Security Council has supported the United States. The Sovietic army launched malicious uh, toward uh, Cuba. I'm but sorry the... uh, to interrupt you, Maria, but I would like to confirm if the other judges present in the room. Dale, could you kindly confirm once? Is Judge Pekka present in the room? Is uh, Judge Becca present in the room? Becca has gone. Yes, I think she might have an internet problem. Very sorry to interrupt you in the middle, but uh, we might have to wait for other judge to return, if that's all right with you. Yes. I have a Thank quick so uh, question. Are you sure she was present during my speech? So, or during yes, I previous was present. Speech? Yes, okay, I have the you. participants icon on, and immediately I saw one participant drop. I went to confirm it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here she comes again. Yeah, she's back. Okay, so well, um, Judge Pekka, uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I would like to uh, ask Astrid to re uh, repeat her uh, argument, if that's all right. I'll reset the timer. So from the beginning? Yeah, I'll reset the timer, if that's all right. Yes. Sure. The time starts now. OK, so you said to us that uh, there were flaws in the judgment. You haven't said, we haven't said that Russia belongs only to the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council, I have to mention, that is the only one who has the power to make it clear it's a mess. COPUS is, de uh, de is a department of General Assembly. Isn't the UN Security Council the most powerful organ? Isn't it the most powerful team uh, than the ge uh, General Assembly? How can you mention that there were two bosses? We haven't said anything about that. You know, Scient Copus already listened to the UN Security Council. So as an, the second speaker uh, said, they, we also give you an example where you know so listen to the UN Security Council. You mentioned that the UN Security Council has nothing especially done on earth. Did you know about the attack on Cuba? In 1962, the UN Security Council was supporting the United States. The Soviet army launched uh, missiles to, to our, toward Cuba, but the, the USA helped them. President John Kennedy decided to place a naval quarantine or blockade on Cuba to prevent further Soviet shipments on missiles. So basically, UN Security Council also stopped the attack upon Cuba. We have clearly shown you that the UN Security Council collaborates with both private and national agencies. According to Simonetta Di Pipo, director of UNOSA, is partnering up with Sierra Space, a private space agency, to offer United Nations member states the opportunity to participate in an orbital space mission utilizing Sierra Space Dream Chaser space plan. According to uh, uh, James Randall, Colonel, uh, Colonel of United States uh, Air Force, also presented by the Space Treaty, the laws relating the space activity will follow the uh, established principle and rules of international law and the United Nations, UN, Carter in uh, accordance with the status of International Court, Court of Justice. One more time, the UN Security Council is more powerful than this organ. It also has the power relating to that. The World Treaty Organization, weren't you talking about the ITU? Talking about hotels based, space debris is happening now. In 2009, satellites colonized. The ISS, don't you think it is a present problem? There are over 22,000 pieces of space debris out there. You aren't simply saying, let them be. There, there is, there, trade is more important. Let's make hotel in space. What if they get hit by space debris? We don't reduce the project um, with educational purposes just to make uh, sure that they won't pollute orbit more than it, it already is. If anyone can launch, this is why there is more space debris out there. It is normal. Thank you. This was uh, the rebuttals from the team Alantara for the second, uh, for the third speaker. Thank you, third speaker. Now. Let's hear from AF 3 and 4 and NEC 3 and 4 in the second format cross-examination. Just a reminder, we want to make sure that every team gets equal chance at asking questions, so kindly make sure of it. Andrea, the next position will begin score six. Your time starts now. Okay, I have a question. What measures do you expect the US Security Council to use for enforcing its measures? For enforcing its nations? Measures. Uh, measures. Um, well, it already has a plan according to which you know some made, but it, it was not put in practice. It has the power to do that with its funds and not only. Does that answer your question? You mentioned a lot about power. UNSC has more power, but what does this power mean? How they make themselves listened on the international arena? We proposed a viable plan of ITU simply denying satellite communications. What sanctions do you have in mind? I'm not talking about sanctions. ITU has no experience related to space. UN Security Council has. Who do you listen to? To someone who has no experience with something or you listen to someone who is who knows about what they do. But every space mission requires a frequency assigned by ITU, and ITU withdraws that frequency if space regulations are not respected. How can you say they have no experience? Uh, okay, I get your point right here. But do you know how the representative, the chief 
of IG was chosen. It is chosen by the UN Security Council. So basically, UN Security Council list uh, the ITU listens to the UN Security Council. Mariah, would you like to add something here? Yes, and also you said that they uh, in your. I want to ask you. You said that there will be a new world out there. I agree with you, but shouldn't be a department that maintains peace and security if there exists one here on earth why shouldn't if you say that there will be a new world out there why shouldn't it be the same that has experience on this out in space as well because security crises are different from terrestrial ones we currently had no space war but even if we would had had have a space war we would need different kind of regulations because space has dangers of chain reactions, for example, Kessler syndrome. We have nothing similar in international relations here on Earth, to give you a mere example. And who do you think is best for this security and peace on space? Scientists, which are scientists which are not present in the UNSC. Where are they present? In UNOSA, in COPUS, in other organizations, which... Okay. Okay, and COPUS and UNOSA are a department of the General Assembly, which is listening to the UN Security Council. No, because UN Security Council is not the most powerful organization in UN, even if you try to convince us of that. The General Assembly is the most powerful. The non-permanent members of the UN Security Council are chosen by the General Assembly. So the General Assembly and its secretariat are clearly more powerful than UNSC. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, but everybody in the team will need to answer the questions as well. Please continue. Okay. Uh, may I also ask one more question for the uh, last speaker of Team Andoya? Sure. Okay, so if we simply Google it, who is the, big, uh, the most important organ and the most powerful organ of the United Nations on Google, it will say us that the United Security Council is and will link us to the United Nations page. How do you relate on that? Because you said that general assemblies. General assembly have more powers. Some evidence, please. In different areas. What proof do you have on that? They don't have uh, only power in, or well, they have only only power in security, but different areas. Including its sub departments, or not. Can you repeat, please? So you said the UN Security Council only has experience in security. Is that right? In security. I or, said or, General Assembly has no. more powers in different areas, not only security. OK, but in how UN Security you... Council is voted by the General Assembly. You didn't answer our question. Like, if we simply Google which is the most powerful organ of the UN, it will, on the United Nations page, it will say UN Security Council. I'm sorry, but the time for cross X is up. Thank you so much, uh, team, for participating. We now have a two minute silent break at this time. Last 30 seconds.
Time is up. Now, our four from Team Alcantara will begin the summary in the four-minute time allotment. The time starts now. Hello again, everybody. Now I'm going to conclude the debate for the final statement with the help of my colleagues, Daniela and Mariah. So Daniela, could you say something about the definition of the terms and both teams' perspective about the resolution? Yes, well, the definition of terms by the other team um, was uh, quite alike to ours, and we think their uh, perspective on the resolution was the correct one. Thank you. So now I'll start summarizing the first argument brought. In my argument, I talked about the space debris and how it is a major problem that STM needs to figure out. Space debris has destroyed, is destroying, and will destroy space objects, for example, the ISS, if we don't do something. Second, the UN Security Council already established guidelines for district space policies. You know, and Copus, which have 95 parameters, thus achieving universalization. Third, UNOSA already has a, pro a, spa a plan program for space debris diminution. Fourth, uh, UN Security Council is developing collaboration not only with national agencies, but also with private agencies, as Mariah presented as well. Next, Mariah, could you please tell us a few words about your argument? Yes, I will highlight the main points for my speech in order to convince you that the UN Security Council should definitely regulate space traffic management. The space activity is exponentially increasing and automatically the space debris is growing. The main problem is that the FAA, the current administration of the space traffic management, isn't currently doing its job, it's properly. How do you uh, want to uh, release space debris when it will be much bigger? The, uh, the International Telecommunication Union already developed a space policy, has a lot of knowledge in cybersecurity and has 193 countries as members. I have explained that the budget uh, on how UNOSA and ITU cannot regulate space traffic management by themselves, but they need the UN Security Council, which is the most powerful body. Thank you. Okay, so in the end, we think that the negative team had very well worked cases. The clashes in the fight were presented by the power of UNOSA and the uh, UN Security Council, uh, the ITU, ITU power, and the debris problem uh, with the World Trade Organization. We think that the cross acts helped, and we can draw the following conclusions out of them. The power of the UN Security Council and UNOSA and how UNOSA does not have enough power to put anything in the practice. It only released several recommendations about debris, nothing in practice. UN Security Council has the power to convince Russia has more than half of the debris out there to clean it. They can put into practice what UNOSA has on paper. Let's just think that uh, it's the budget. $65.9 billion versus $3.9 million for UNOSA, which has more power. Besides power, UNOSA also does not have the, have the budget for space debris missions. The NAG team said it does. Uh, they also mentioned the existence of, of an organization which is doing its job with space debris. Is it really doing it? A Russian satellite and American uh, satellites crashed in 2009 at a very high speed bursting with a cloud of thousands of pieces of space debris. Besides that, two weeks ago, the ISS was hit by uh by space, uh, by space junk, leaving a hole in their body arm. These are like 12 years beside in besides these two uh, accidents. It's nothing changed. Besides that, the negative team has uh, future plans. This is not bad, but their vision, I think it is a little bit because they have talked about the World Trade Organization, uh, talking about hotels. Space debris is happening now. The 2009 satellite collision, the ISS, do you think this is a present problem? There are over 22,000 pieces of space debris out there. So we're simply saying, let's them be. Trade is more important. Let's make hotels in space. What if they get hit by space debris? World trade organizations, what experience do they have in space domain? They don't. UN Security Council is way more justified for that. Uh, I don't think they have understood that COPUS does not have enough power for STM regulation. The UN Security Council is more powerful than COPUS. Uh, the COPUS boss, the General Assembly. The same happens with E2. Its General Secretary and Representative is chosen by the UN Security Council. They have strongly mentioned, with, but with no existing evidence, that the General Assembly is the most powerful organ in the UN. Excuse me, but this is simply false. Just type this on Google or on Google Scholar. Well, who is the most powerful organ of the UN? And you will simply find the answer we have given right on the UN.org. I'm sorry about the time. Thank you very much. This was Team Alcantara. Thank you, Team Alcantara. Now, next four delivers the Andrea summary in the four minute time allotment. The time starts now. To begin with, affirmative stars agreed that the US Security Council should be in charge of space traffic management. However, as my teammates mentioned, the UN Security Council was designed for solving terrestrial problems, where it proves very ineffective. Several successes cannot cover a long list of failures. A single incident think of Sarajevo, assassinated in 1914, is enough to start a world war. 
making it responsible for the space affairs will only over stretch it even more, further decreasing its effectiveness. For example, nowadays we have the Ethiopia Trigay conflict where millions of people are starving while thousands of women and girls are being sexually abused. How should the UN Security Council divide its attention between SDM and this humanitarian crisis? In addition to that, the firm is that ensures that Security Council brings universalization. However, we have demonstrated that this is simply not true. This is because the P5 had the veto power to reject every resolution that doesn't benefit them directly. Consequently, developing nations will not have a voice within the decision making process. Think only of India, whose space program will be vetoed by China. Since the UN appeared until 1971, China seat belonged to the current Taiwan. We consider UN Security Council obsolete components different from the actual distribution of space power. On the other hand, the negative side demonstrated that, demonstrated that the space traffic is already highly regulated in manner leading to the universalization. It's basically becoming cheaper, therefore more, more democratic and more universalized. UN Security Council intervention would reverse this trend by helping permanent members enforce their views. Since the economic dimension of space exploration develops as emerging space tourism shows, we should use regulators specialized in trade, such as the World Trade Organization. UN Security Council specializes in conflict and even worse, but universalization implies keeping cosmos aside from the phenomena. Affirmative desires Affirmative says that UN Security Council is the only possible to regulate regulator capable of enforcing sanctions. However, COPOS and UNOSA are already proven to be good regulators. If a space agency doesn't respect the rules, then ITU can sanction it by making its satellites useless. ITU sanctions very, are very targeted since they target only space programs. All its secretaries are elected seems a true concern of affir affirmative, but we find that not really relevant. On the other hand, UN Security Council is capable of targeting only economy, bringing poverty or diplomacy, threatening universalization. As my team has previously mentioned, even space areas are already regulated. So affirmative proposal of United Nations Security Council intervention is not justified. IADC, IADC consists of international experts who produce rules for preventing space areas approved by the UN General Assembly. These rules are now mandatory for many agencies. This is a true example of universalization, a global cooperation led to a set of global rules. Therefore, we simply do not require United Nations Security Council, which doesn't even consist of experts on space traffic, to propose other rules. We have also presented how space agencies have various projects to eliminate space areas. Since everyone wants to keep exploring space, there's a natural incentive to remove these areas, making regulation by the United Nations Security Council useless. To summarize, space traffic management shouldn't be regulated by the UN Security Council. Even if Google presented is presented as the etalon for enforcing power, the affirmative takes a high risk by considering the UN Security Council is capable for changing its paradigm from destructive competition on Earth to space affairs. They are also overconfident the UN Security Council will be able to adapt to this new task. The affirmative size high risks by hoping the UN Security Council can manage space traffic despite its proving ineffectiveness. In this permanent environment, you consider global benefits before national interest. However, hope should remain in Pandora's box, as it is virtually impossible for all these assumptions to occur. On the other hand, the negative side provided a more prudent approach. We consider the current realities and also its issues. We show how STM is already managed by the United Nations in successful example of applied universalization. While the United Nations Security Council will only slow our space programs, bring competition, and threaten the current cooperation on space affairs. They make us confident we are providing the correct approach to the delicate situation. Thank you. Thank you, Nekfo. The judges now adjourn to their breakout rooms for the deliberation. They may have eight minutes, but we encourage you to return as soon as you can to the main room. I'm going to open the breakout room now. Can we have uh, everyone's cameras and mics on, please? Wonderful. Even coaches, moderators, spectators, please, if you can, please, uh, on your cameras and mics. Okay, so well, I have to say I'm amazed by how well you guys have come ahead and your debate is just phenomenal. It's, it's mind blowing. I'm very sure that the judges are having a hard time deciding who is the winner. So <laughs> sympathy for them. Okay, so I have a couple of questions for you guys as you guys are the finalists. So could anyone of you uh, describe and tell me that how was your journey from your first debate 
to the finals? What did you guys learn? What were the tips that tips and tricks that you picked out from your other teams and coaches and improvised and came here? If anybody could elaborate on that. First of all, before answering your questions, I would like to thank you for uh, all these uh, wonderful moments you gave us with these questions because they are truly relaxing. And uh, I want to thank you for that. Uh, I think that during the SPAN uh, progress, I, uh, I learned how to refine my arguments. I learned how to listen more to my opponents, to uh, make my a rebuttal more effective, more targeted on what they said. So it was truly a journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else who would like to add to that? Uh, I can add something. Well, uh, Andre, this time I agree with you. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, you're right. I also started to listen to other people better because uh, you guys are from I don't know, Peru, Japan, like states as well. So it's at the beginning of the, it was hard for me to hear the different dialects and understand what people say, but now it is easier and I really enjoy that. And besides that, uh, through this experience, so from the first match till now, I heard different points and opinions about STM regulations and who should regulate. And I managed to improve my arguments as well because a lot of people thought about things I didn't do. And I think this is the most important thing of this debate because you can learn from what other people say and watch their opinion on that point as well. That, that's really nice. Thank you so much. And well, uh, a question to Dr. Edmonds. How did you feel seeing a final, a final debate conversation today compared to the previous years we have started along and how do you feel it was? Or do you think the quality has increased? Or was it more thrilling? How do you feel about it? Well, I don't think there's any question the quality is increasing every year. Um, I think, you know, from, from my own experience, uh, what I've learned is that the whole arena of co cooperation, the whole idea of, of really challenging you to work in an environment where you must cooperate and include everybody in the conversation. And also make the point that it's, it's not the debate that's important, it's the content of the debate that prevails. You always have to ask your question, when you move into a policy framework, are you arguing for the sake of arguing? Or are you actually trying to get to the best solution for everybody? And I think that's what I'm seeing from all of you. I think you're really trying to move into that arena where all of you are playing a role and all of you are instrumental in bringing to the forefront what is the most important answer that you're seeking in order to better the world within a universal construct. Because that is the challenge that we will face in your generation. This is a world within the universe where unless we cooperate and unless you learn how to do that. And that means involving everybody and hearing everybody's voices and then moving forward. And I saw that today. I think there's always room for improvement. I think everybody can reflect themselves. Did I do enough? Was my voice heard? Was I present enough? Did I allow my team members to be present? You know, you have to reflect and, and looking at the recording, look back and say, you know, did I do my utmost? Because that's always the question, but that's also the lesson learned. And this is part of your journey as students, you're young, you have a whole future ahead of you and we rely on you because you will be our next generation of leaders. So yeah, I'm really proud. I'm really proud of Frances and her leadership and all of the colleagues and, and who worked with you to bring you to the forum today. I'm really proud of Aperva and Suvik who've just been instrumental as, as, as young adults advising us how to engage with you in a meaningful way so that today you have achieved a success that, oh yeah, I mean, I am, I'm incredibly proud. It kind of gives me goosebumps actually <laughs> to see just what an incredible, incredible group of leaders you are going to be. So thank you so much for all that you did this past year to make this event today the remarkable event that it was and is. Thank you so much, Dr. Edmund. It means a lot to us. It means the world to us. 
Well, uh, from my previous room, <laughs> I think <laughs> Team Andoya knows one of my funny questions about the extraterrestrials. Wasn't isn't that right, Team Andoya? Uh, you guys know the extraterrestrial question that right? I had asked. Okay, yes, we had it yesterday. Yes. So um, maybe I want to keep this question for Team Alcantara. So before that, how many of you guys believe in extraterrestrial life forms? Raise your hand. Andoya. Okay, Andre, Sajir. Oh, welcome, man. Great. Okay, wow, no okay so um, the question will be for Team Alcantara. Uh, supposedly, uh, take, let's take the STM situations and we come in contact with the uh, high civilization extraterrestrial species and they try to make contact with us. In that case, which organization do you think? Is this, this is not related to the debate. It's, it's your personal opinion. So feel free to say whatever you want. Not to take any signs. Which organization do you think will be most suitable to you know talk with the uh, to manage the space traffic at that particular moment? What satellites goes up there? What weaponry goes up there? About the first communication and you know bringing them here on Earth. So if anybody would like to answer that. Okay, I think that's a very deep question. <laughs> Do you something... have any, any question for Suvek about his question? Oh my God. Do you? Okay, fine. Uh, do you guys have any questions related to, to this to me? If you guys like to ask me any questions regarding this. I have a question for the group, Sebek. Okay. Okay, I'm wondering, um, I was talking to some uh, coaches yesterday and our forum is very different than uh, many of you have experienced with uh, debating. I'd like to um, have a, a show of hands for the ones who of you who have never debated before this project. So Maria? And Valentina? I have well. debated, but just in Romanian. I'm sorry, say again? I have debated, but not in English, just in Romanian, and it's much Oh difficult. my goodness! Well, kudos, kudos. And yes. um, Valentino and, and, and Dennis, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, if this is your first time uh, debating in English or first time debating at all, um, I think um, that's, that's what we try to do with the online course is to boost you up so that you could now start to um, kind of mix it up with the rest of your teammates. And then those who were veterans, um, Andre, uh, both Andres, uh, I've seen you before and your leadership has been very important in this. Um, did the um, online course for those of you who have not debated before help you in, in being able to be a little bit more confident when you came into your teams? Uh, let me ask Dennis that. Dennis, do you recall the online course you took back in uh, January? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, that's what I'm asking about. If that helped you uh, prepare yourself for um, working with your team in a, a forum that you've never worked in before? Yeah, it helped me, especially the video about the uh, note taking. It was important for me yeah. in this debate. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had a video about how uh, what stages a debate has uh, with the rebuttals, with the introductions, and but it was a bit different here because we had a cross examination, which yeah. I did then hear about. Mm -hmm. I think they helped me, uh, especially because I didn't have any experience before in debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The cross ex was a an addition that was brought in actually. Um, uh, while while we were still preparing uh, in like January, so it was like a late edition this year that the coaches were asking us because they wanted to see uh, like a one on one more exciting uh, part of it instead of just you know reading speeches. And uh, so um, the experience was was very interesting for me to see that. Um, Fajr, what was your oh we have our we have our uh, our Chapter judges five. back. All right, yeah. thank you. Well, so the judges are back and I, we are very excited to hear the result. 
So please give team your feedback and announce the winners. And we have five minutes for it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us both here. We are really excited to watch this debate and some others over the last weekend or few weeks. I know I've enjoyed myself judging at this competition the last two years now. So some I wanted to talk about some of the commendable aspects and opportunities for improvement for both the teams. And I'll let Alice talk in a minute about what we decided for the outcome of the debate. For the affirmative team, we thought some really commendable aspects for you were you used a lot of outside research and you made very clear where is this research from by sharing the source allowed during the speeches. Another thing we thought was done really well was delivery, especially with hand gestures. And we liked the collaborative approach to the final speech. So those were some commendable aspects for the affirmative team. Some areas to improve. We thought you could discuss the concept of universalization more in the first two speeches. And we thought that the first cross-examination went really, really well for the affirmative side. But in the second cross-examination, we think there could be more improvement with letting the opponents ask some questions and treating them with a little bit uh, more respect. You might be facing the internet lag. Cool enthusiasm for your arguments. And we thought you had a very consistent discussion of universalization in all of the speeches. Some opportunities for improvement for the negative team include, we thought the first cross-examination did not go as well for this side with answering questions. So we thought the team members could coordinate a little more in advance about who is going to answer questions for your side and making sure that you get some time to ask some questions as well. Really, really great performance by everybody. It was a very close debate. We enjoyed watching it. You've made yourselves and your countries really, really proud. And I'll let Alice talk about how we decided the outcome of the debate. Yeah, I wanna thank everyone for participating and doing the research and, and um, letting us hear your examples and hear your, your thoughts about this important topic. Um, the National Space Society is misnamed. It should be the International Space Society. And we're very interested, especially in our educational branch, about bringing all the nations of the world together um, and having uh, the use of space be, be universal, um, not only for the, the most powerful nations and the nations that have <clears throat> um, space presence now, but also um, to allow, as uh, the negative side said, for students to participate in space and making sure that the, the I thought it was very powerful when you said that students should participate and those, and those students should be able to be from any nation on earth. <clears throat> Even though it might contribute to space debris to have CubeSats up there, um, we need to figure out a way to make sure that, that all students from all over the world can participate. So it was extremely close. Um, we had a very difficult time choosing a winner, but we had to choose a winner. Um, so with the universalization um, argument being better on the negative side, we, we chose the negative side as the winner. And we want to thank all of you um, for all of the work you put into this. Uh, it was very enjoyable for us and, and we really appreciate your time and effort. Thank you so much judges and uh, excellent job everyone. Can you have a round of applause for everyone please? 
and also congratulations to the winner. Thank you all for participating in the final debate in the 2021 uh, Spun Virtual Debate, June 19. The debate program would not be possible without the student debaters, coaches, hosts, and judges. Many, many thanks to you. I just have a quick announcement. NSS Town Hall Spun Debate Awards event will be held on July 10th at 12 p.m. UTC, and everyone is invited. These are some exciting surprises for all the teams participating in the Spun Virtual Debates 2021, and not just the finalists. So stay tuned for more information coming soon to your mail and also save the dates. Thank you so much. Congratulations once again to both the fantastic teams today. And uh, judges, if please, you could remain in the room for reporting purposes. Thank you so much. Oh, please. Recording stop, please.